uh, let's begin. Welcome to the um, second clinical webinar of Exit. Common issues with aligner planning and how to avoid them. My name is Konstantin Pipunirov. I am the sales manager for Exit and I am responsible for the uh, Western Europe. I will give you the short introduction um, of the company, then the, the clinical part presentation uh, is going to be um, presented by Dr. David Arias, the clinical manager of Exceed, and then we will proceed with the um, short Q&A question. All together we have uh, about an hour, so um, let's begin. What is Exceed? Um, basically, we are the 3D orthodontic planning and pre-production services provider. So we create the um, aligner plans as well as the uh, indirect bonding planning. So our customers, uh, mostly dental, dentists, um, orthodontists and dental labs are able to fabricate and provide the high quality yet affordable orthodontic appliances. So it all starts with the um, scanning the patient when you can use both the intraoral scanners or you can send the traditional impressions to our office in Germany. After we um, receive and approve all diagnostic materials, uh, we come up with the aligner plans. So um, that can be either approved or sent to the revision before you're 100% satisfied with the aligner planning. And then when it's approved, you receive the Printing, model, uh, printing files for your uh, 3D printers so you can uh, print the working models or the break it and trace to fabricate your orthodontic uh, appliances. So um, yeah. To enable uh, this operation, we have developed the uh, software um, components, four software components, um, basically starts with my exit. This is the um, personal account that you can upload your uh, uh, diagnostic materials, the dental models, the pictures and x-ray. Um, all these orders are accumulated by the ERP system where we uh, track our orders and uh, follow them. This is uh, also could be interesting for those who are interested in the uh, own production under the own brand. So the ERP system can be also set up uh, for your needs as well. So if you're in case you're interested in the um, full-scale aligner brand production. So after the uh, orders are submitted and received and uh, checked by our technical department, the design software is being used where we uh, actually plan the case. And later on, we present it at the doctor software. So uh, let me give you just a short overview. This is my exit, uh, pretty basic stuff when you can uh, upload the and manage your orders as you can see, we need uh, the intraoral pictures, the profile pictures and x-rays, as well as the uh, digital models, the STL files, scan and occlusion, both JOS, obviously, and also the treatment wishes, what to do, how do you see it? Um, this is the uh, Exit software. As you can see, uh, the software is pretty heavy. It has a lot of modules, uh, features, um, it is made for the internal use. Of course, it's not the only um, orthodontic planning software on the market, uh, but being the planning service, we are able to receive the feedback uh, from our uh, customers uh, pretty fast and implement the new features and new models. So uh, that makes us pretty um, unique in that sense. So. Um, as you can see, this is the, doc, the design software that we use. The doctor software is um, actually used for the presenting the plans. And um, as you can see, uh, we have the web-based, we have the desktop version. They're basically the same, but uh, at the desktop version, at the standalone version, you have the ability to make little changes in the initial plan yourself. But most of our users, I would say 90% of our users, they use the web-based as it is more simple and requires no maintenance or uh, updates or whatsoever. So 
As for the services, uh, we actually started from the um, classic indirect bonding um, back in the days. So uh, we also provide the setup based uh, bracket placement and the lingual based uh, lingual bracket placement. But uh, the main project right now is the aligner planning. So, but if you uh, provide both of those services, that could be uh, really convenient to take it from the one window, so to say. Just a short uh, overview of the Exit Kit advantages. Uh, we have delivered 50,000 aligner plans since 2015. Um, it really gives us uh, enough experience and uh, expertise. So we know what we do. Uh, every plan is checked by the uh, orthodontist um, or dentist uh, in order to um, post only clinically defensible plans and to reduce the number of the revisions and uh, the refinements as well. So this is also really important. As I said, the software that we uh, own uh, was uh, developed by us and for us. And uh, being the planning service, we also uh, receive um, the feedback and we can implement the new features. But also important to say that we are not only the theoretical software company, we plan and we are very close to the production as well. So when it comes to the uh, manufacturing, we support the whole cycle. So we will give you the files. The files are uh, labeled by the case ID and the step number. We provide you with the sticker information for your labels. Um, so it is really convenient to produce it in your practice. Uh, and we know the little details that should be uh, taken care of. And the last but not least is the fact that 3D plans can be easily shared with the patients um, via um, emails or uh, WhatsApp messages, but uh, they can be uh, easily accessed by the, um, any, any mobile device. So in times like this, uh, maybe it is a nice feature as well. So uh, let me present the Dr. David Arias. Um, uh, he is the clinical manager of Exceed. Um, he graduated from the uh, Dental University at San Jose at Costa Rica. He owns and maintains the practice, the own practice there. Um, he used to work as the clinical supervisor for Alliant Technologies, serving uh, mostly the uh, platinum and uh, diamond providers from USA and Canada. And um, during his career, he overused more than 10,000 cases. So uh, that makes him uh, really uh, experienced. So uh, without further ado, let me present you Dr. Davis Darius. David, your phone is off, uh, your microphone is off. You might wanna turn it on. Okay, perfect, thank you. <laughs> okay, so can you hear me well? We can hear you. Okay, perfect. So just like Constantine was saying, uh, well, uh, for the last almost four years, I have been dedicated exclusively working with the liners. I think it's something that allow us doctors to be very efficient on how we work because when, well, I know we have orthodontists, we have TPs in this lecture, but for the ones that are already using aligners, they know the amount of time they can save in each appointment because we don't need to go and remove the ligatures or change the wires. So it is an appliance that if we know what we are doing, it's very simple to have great results. So that is what we are going to talk about today. We are going to give you some tips that can actually help you in your practice. So in here and just let me... This, okay, so in here, what we are going to talk about is about treatment planning and case selection, treatment velocities, attachments, interproximal contacts, heavy anterior contacts. So I'm going to go a little bit fast because we only have around 40, 50 minutes, but you can always write the questions. And at the end, we are going to have a Q&A session. And also some of the articles that I'm going to show in here uh, you can find them online. So we are going to have this on YouTube. This is being recorded. So you can later check that on YouTube and you can just search for those articles. So it is very important how we are planning our treatments because right now it's very difficult to give you like 
and a straight approach. Because remember that when we are treating patients, what we want to base our treatments are on systematic reviews and meta-analysis. But right now, all the meta-analysis and systematic reviews that if you go online and you check them and you read those articles, what they say at the end is that they need to be analyzed carefully. And this is because, okay, the material that you use is going to affect a lot. And not only the material properties, but also the thickness, also the attachments, also how you program the velocities. So that is why what I'm going to tell you about today is going to be a little bit more about my experience and what I have seen that work the best from my side. So first of all, we have the correct treatment planning and it is important that we never, or we don't want to forget how, that every case should be planned and not only to go upload the records and tell the technicians, okay, just go ahead and do an alignment, an alignment or just solve the anterior crowding. In here is actually something very beneficial if we go and we do this phallometric analysis. Why? And well, if you want, you can do it yourself uh, or you can just hire an external service or now there are a lot of softwares that they can help you with that. You just uh, select the points and they did all the calculations very rapidly, two minutes and you're done. And why we want to do this? Because in a situation like this case, where we have retroclination of those teeth, we don't know where the roots are. So what is an advantage of having a cephalometric analysis in there? I'm able to see the inclination of those incisors. So for example, let's say I have Nation, I have point B, and I have in here the incisors, that I want to move. So I just go and we know that this is going to give us a degree. So I see if that is in the parameters that we want or if I need to change that. So if I see that maybe I'm 10 degrees away from ideal. So it's very easy for me to give an instruction to the technician because I just want to tell the technician, okay, just go ahead and do 10 degrees of uh, buccal crown torque or lingual root torque. So having an analysis uh, is going to help me a lot to just create a better plan and to make sure that at the end what I'm going to have is a very uh, successful result that I'm going to be able to find that uh, anterior guidance in a perfect balance those lateral movements so it is important that in here even if we are working with aligners that we don't forget to make the proper analysis and not only that we need to also take some things into consideration for those of you that are starting with aligners what what I would recommend is to first start with cases that we maintain in predictable amount of movements. So what do I mean? I mean that based on the literature and based on what we recommend for you not to exceed those values. At the end, when you have more experience, when you have treated 40, 50, 100 patients, then you can begin to change everything around. But at the beginning, it's very important to just try to treat those simple cases that are going to give us the confidence to later go ahead and treat more complex cases. So it is important that this is a systematic review that was done in 2014, that the movements that have been found to be really predictable with the liners are distalization. Also movements that we can do very well are extrusion. So I wouldn't say that right now this is valid Remember that this study was done a little bit earlier in the days when our liners were just starting to be used a lot more. So now with the use of attachments, we can control extrusions really well. Rotations, we are going to talk about this later, but rotations depends on the anatomy of the teeth. If those teeth are really rounded, then sometimes it's going to be difficult to rotate them. Incisors, even canines are not so difficult to rotate them because what happens is that we have a surface that is actually not flat, but virtually flat. So we have places where we can push. We can just go ahead and we can program two forces, the couple of forces to get a rotation. But if you have a premolar, for example, if you go in here and you go in here to try to make a rotation, sometimes we don't have enough area of surface where we can push. So it is in these situations that we can still make rotations of premolars, but we might need to go and use attachments. Uh, imagine this is from the occlusal view, right? Sorry for the drawings. So by having 
some other surfaces is where we can go and we can push. So that is also one important thing about using attachments. So intrusions, those are movements that we can do very well, but we need to plan the anchorage. We can gain a lot more than 0.72 millimeters, but we need to really plan the anchorage for that. And for that, we need to use attachments. And we are also going to discuss this later. And this, this study, we can see that values that are predictable of, well, with the little index, the amount of crowding that we are solving, are five millimeters in mandible and four millimeters in maxilla, but this is without us doing IPR or without us doing distalization. So if we start incorporating those other movements, then we can even solve cases that have more crowding. But it's important not only to take into consideration the amount of movement, but also with the population that we are working. That is why at the beginning it's better to go ahead and just, well, treat those patients that are a little bit easier to see how our population is going to react. Because, and this is just something that happened to me, I went to Cuba, to La Habana, to make a course, uh, and I was placing their mini implant stats. And to tell you the truth, okay, you needed to do first an osteotomy before you place the mini implant, because the bone of the people in there is very, very tough. If you go even with those self skating stats or mini implants, if you try to perforate, well, that mini implant is just going to get the uh, the tip blurred and is not going to enter. So it is in here also to take into consideration that in our population, we might need to go and make movements or a little bit slower or maybe use those aligners a little bit longer or actually the opposite. So in here is also why we want to do those simple cases at the beginning because we also want to get that experience on how our patients react. Because in this study, for example, what they found out is that women who were between 18 and 35 years of age, right? And the women who were between 50 and 70 years of age, the um, movements that happened in there were slower with clear aligners. So this means that those women between 35 to 50 years old, they were actually showing better and faster movements. And this is why we may need to be careful with how we program the case because it's not only to consider the amount of movement that is predictable, but also to consider, okay, the velocities that I'm going to use. And we are going to talk about this later, but we need to change sometimes those velocities according to the people that we are working and according to the results that we are seeing. So this you can enter later. This is a study that was done by... Uh, in here, Dr. Weir, uh, he published this in the Australian Dental Journal. So what he did in here is that he went ahead and he grabbed some of the values from different companies and he made this table that gives you like the predictable, moderate and difficult movements. If you want, you can take a screenshot. I think even if you just place this online, it is for free. You can find it on, for free in there. So in here, um, well, you can access this later. I'm going to talk about the important things only. Okay, crowding, even six, eight millimeters, I will tell you, you can do it very well. And that is because aligners are really efficient at distalizing if you know how to use them. And I'm going to show you later. Midline discrepancies, these are movements that are not such a big issue, central rotation, lateral rotations. In here is where I will be careful. Canine and premolar rotations. Some companies and this article, for example, says up to 45 degrees of rotation. And to tell you the truth, for me, it's not near close to that. For me, if you want to make sure that that movement is going to happen, I will maintain around 20 degrees. So what happened? We don't want to give that patient an outcome that is not perfect. Well, I focus a lot on occlusion. So for me, my cases, they need to have the occlusion perfect at the end. They need to be stable because I want for that condyle to be in a stable position and that occlusion to be working at the maximum level. So when we have cases that maybe we are doing more than 20 degrees of rotation is where I would consider in there to use elastics. So for example, this is again from the occlusal view. I have in here the premolar, let's say this is the canine, and I have in here this other premolar. So if I need to rotate this more than 20 degrees, 
I will just go ahead from the beginning. You can wait, you can just, well, start the treatment and see how everything is tracking. For myself, I prefer just to go ahead and ask for those uh, spaces for me to place the buttons. And I will use an elastic from here to here, from here to here, just to get a couple of forces and get the rotation that I want. Or what happens also, when we are working in lower premolars, and I'm sure all of you have seen that, the lingual surface of the premolars is very, very short, is something like this. You have the gingiva very high, normally in those uh, lower ones. So in those situations, what can you do? You can go ahead and instead of using, for example, those two elastics, you can only use uh, one. So you can go and bun a button on, let's say this is the second premolar. This is the first one. So you can go and bun a button in here and here, and you can use in these situations, we use a chain elastic. We don't use a regular rubber band. And we go ahead and we put this chain elastic below the interproximal contact. And the patient is only placing the aligners on top of that. They don't need to remove it. So by doing this, we can just go ahead and make the rotation. So this is something useful in situations that maybe we cannot go ahead and place a lot of uh, buttons and elastics in there because we don't have enough surface. So in here, that was important about canine premolar rotation. I wouldn't trust this too much. Then extrusions, for me, this is good, 2.5. And intrusions, I will say more, and we are going to see how to achieve this later. And posterior intrusion is something that we can also do very well. Posterior extrusion is in here what I want to talk about. So we need to take into consideration that in our patients, uh, this is not just like regular braces. We have a material in there between that upper and lower arch. So this means that the patient is biting into this surface in here of the aligners. So let's imagine you are using an occlusal bite plane, right? In a child. When you remove that occlusal bite plane, you always see intrusion of those posterior teeth. You see that those posterior teeth, they are not touching very well. And this is because the patient is only biting in here in that posterior region. This is the same thing that happens with the liners. With the liners, we may be trying to extrude a molar in here, but the patient is only biting in the back because remember that that liner is going to open the uh, bite in the front. So the patient is only biting in the back. So that means that all the forces are being applied in the molars and premolars. So we are trying to extrude while at the same time we are trying, well, the close of force is actually intruding us. So if we want to make a posterior extrusion, then what I would recommend is to ask for a bite ramp. So for the ones of you that doesn't know the bite ramp, it is just a bubble in the aligner. You don't need to go and fill it with composite. You only want that bubble in there. They, you can ask for that on the incisors or in the canines. So what we do with that biram is that the patient is biting in here and this will open in here the bite at the posterior region. So by us liberating those posterior teeth, then we can start to make extrusion movements of those posterior teeth. And it's in here where I was telling you, okay, when you get more experience, you are not going to worry about the predictable values of movement because, okay, let's say I need to extrude those molars two millimeters, one millimeter upper, one millimeter lower. In those situations, I just go bottom button on the molar in here and well, I can use box elastics, triangular elastic, however you want, and put an elastic and you can be completely sure that with that one millimeter of extrusion in each tooth, it's going to happen in one, two months, very, very easily. But because I'm liberating those teeth from occlusion and I'm using elastics. So this is something that we are going to be able to do with our clinical experience uh, later. But to tell you what I believe is that those uh, vibrams in the anterior teeth actually help us a lot in our cases. That is one of the features that we should always use when we can, because by liberating those posterior teeth from occlusion, we can get rotations, we can get angulations, and all of these movements a lot faster. Obviously, if you have an anterior open bite, then you don't want to use 
the anterior bivariums because you actually uh, want to close that bite anteriorly. You can close it with extrusion. So if you are extruding those anterior teeth, if you put the bivariums, then it's the same as in the posterior, like you are having those two different forces. But if you have an anterior open bite that you want to close it with posterior intrusion, then not having the bivariums in there are going to help. Or just with anterior extrusion, those bivariums are not going to help us in there. But for all the other cases, one of my recommendations will be to go and use bivariums in well when you can. Uh, right now, and let me go back and in here, and I will show you a case. And this is something that for me is very advantageous of using Exit because, okay, with Exit, well, if you want to see the amount of movement that we are doing, you just need to make a click on the tooth. This is the desktop version. Later, I'm going to show you the web version. In this desktop version, uh, for the ones that have worked with other aligners, this is like the desktop version of Align Technologies from Invisalign. This is the same. You can go ahead and you can make uh, rotations, extrusion, extrusions. So in here, if you click the tooth, you can see the rotations, the inclinations, the angulations, all of the movement that that tooth is doing. And in here is where you can see, okay, maybe this case is going beyond my uh, area of knowledge. So maybe I'm not going to treat it with aligners or no, I already have the experience. I will go ahead and I will do it. So you can see that in there. Also, one great advantage that we have is that we can go and we can tell the technician from the beginning, okay, I want to see different outcomes. And this is not for me, for example. This is more for the patient. And this is a case. And this patient, well, I have it on hold because of everything that happened. But this patient is having in their anterior protrusion, but it's a lot. This patient cannot even close his lips. Both of his arches are really protruded. So what I want to do is that I want to distalize both arches. I will use an infrasigmatic mini implant in the upper arch and a one mini implant in the buccal shelf and I will distalize both arches. But I want to show the patient why I want to do this. So I can go ahead and I can tell the technician, okay, show me three cases. And they will actually send you those three cases uh, at the same time. So one case that this is the one that is with extractions of premolars, I can tell the technician, okay, show me a case of distalization of in there of both arches. In here, I'm going to treat that with mini implants, like I mentioned, or show me a case just with IPR, for example, because I don't want to do this amount of IPR on a patient, but it's a way on how I can explain to the patient why I'm choosing that option. So this is something that is really advantageous for me to be able to at the same time have three different possibilities or more possibilities just for me to be able to explain the patient why we are doing that. But also if you go in here, you have the occlusogram. So with the occlusogram, and this is something that I really enjoy, is that you are able not just to see the contacts initially and at the end, but you may see interferences during the treatment. So these red, dark brown colors, this means that you have a really heavy contact. So in here, I'm able to also see that. And additionally, and well, let me just put this. If you go here down where it says diagnostics, you can actually measure, uh, well, the arch width if you want, and you can change these dots. If you move those dots, it's going to, well, change the amount of, uh, well, or the distance. You can see this in here. For example, this arch measures 130 millimeters. But also in here, you can see, and let me just remove this so you can see it better, the teeth width. So you can actually go ahead and make a Bolton analysis or you can even plan for implants to leave the same amount of space. So you can also move these from different views. Also, you have the cross section, just like if it was a CT. So in here, if you move this around, you are going to be able to see the cross section of the model. 
in here. And you can also change this in here, the field of view that you want to see. And then in here, you can also see the arch width and you can use this and I use this a lot to see how much I'm changing the width between Canaan to Canaan or between molar to molar. And again, here it's up to how you study this. If you study this measurement between buccal surfaces, you just go ahead and move this and this value will automatically get adjusted or from lingual cusp or just from the center of the tooth. So these are the advantages in here that are going to allow us to make better treatment plannings. Uh, let me go a little bit faster because we are running out of time in here. So that was the first point. The second point will be uh, in here, the velocities. And this is a case that we are going to see later, but in here is the velocities of our treatment, the amount of movement that we are going to make. And some doctors actually, they think that this is just related to the patient and it is not. This is related to the properties of the material that we are using. Why I told you this, imagine you have a case in there that you have a canine in here and you have the lateral and the central down here. You're never going to start with the stainless steel wire going all the way up, right? If you use a stainless steel wire, what is going to happen is that this wire is not going to come down. It's going to get a permanent deformation. The same thing can happen with the aligners. You need to remember that the aligners, they are going to have the final position incorporated. So for example, the aligner that you receive is the position where the tooth are going to, or the teeth are going to be after two weeks. So that means that when the patient puts that aligner on, that aligner is going to stretch. If you go ahead and you tell the technician, okay, I want, I see 30 aligners, I want to have 10 aligners. Go and make that case three times faster. What you're doing is that if we were moving those teeth every 0.2 millimeters of movement per aligner, now it's going to be 0.6 millimeters. So what is going to happen as soon as the patient puts that aligner on, what you're going to see in there is that the patient comes back two weeks later and you don't have any movement. That is because the aligner stretches 6.6 uh, .6 millimeters and now that was too much. It got permanent deformation and now it cannot go back to the original position and we didn't have any movement. So this is important because in a lot of situations and this happened not only with us, I think in every company doctor, they want to make faster treatments. And if you go and you tell the technicians increase velocities, actually what you may be risking is for that aligner getting permanent deformation and not being able to get that movement. And if you think about it, that is the same reason why uh, many uh, places they tell you, okay, use one week wear. Why use one week wear and not just to increase the velocity? Is because of this. Because if you increase the velocity, then, well, the aligner is going to stretch too much and you're not going to get a movement. So our recommendation is two week wear. Myself, I use those aligners every one week. So this is something that you can also do when you already have more experience using this aligner, for example, because you're going to see which movements happen faster and which ones don't. So one recommendation, if you want to maybe incorporate this in the future is that you can start, okay, give those patients two aligners. Okay, you give those two aligners. Every two weeks, you see the patient in one month if everything is tracking well, you tell the patient, okay, now I'm going to give you three aligners, come back in one month. Use those aligners uh, 10 days each. If that patient comes, okay, at the end of the month and everything is tracking well, then you can go to seven days. And then, well, you are actually making faster treatments without you needing to go ahead and increase in velocities. And you are going to have more predictable results. And for me, this is better. I even have friends that they do use Propel. For the ones that they don't know Propel, it is like you make micro perforations on the bone. So uh, these doctors, they go and they do micro perforations to the bone and they change those aligners every three days. This means that they, in one month, they use 10 aligners. For me, I don't like to do that because I focus a lot in biology. I don't want to accelerate movements. I want to give enough time to the body to readapt. But well, 
those are things that you can also incorporate into your practice. You can use propel, you can use corticotomies. There are a lot of uh, appliances like vibrations or laser therapy that you can use to make your treatment faster without you decreasing the predictability. So it is important that in several articles, uh, this was by Skype, they saw that the aligner activation was going to be reduced by the amount of activation and by the amount of times the patient removed that aligner on. So this means that the force that we are going to apply on those teeth is going to decrease if the patient is, uh, well, taking those aligners off every, well, like every hour, or if you are increasing too much the velocity. So this is also important to take into consideration. We want to tell the patient, okay, only remove those aligners to brush your teeth and to eat. Okay, don't go and remove them every once in a while because that will just reduce the force of those aligners. And I mean, here is also a study by Nochi Kota, uh, where, well, he saw the same exact thing that when they were doing uh, more activations on the aligners, uh, they weren't getting the movement. And this happened because of permanent deformation of that aligner. And these studies, just the same, they went ahead. And this is by Andrea Cortona. They did uh, three different types of rotations on the premolars. And they saw that the rotation that happened the most predictable was the one that were, was not exceeding 1.2 degrees. So this lower movement sometimes are going to be more predictable and more predictability will reduce our refinements at the end. So I prefer to have five, six extra liners in my initial therapy to actually go in the end and scan the patient again and send refinements. For me, it's more time efficient. So then the attachments, and this is very important. When we go back to uh, like biomechanics, the basics of orthodontics, we know that if we want to control the root, we need to have a relationship or a ratio between the amount of force that we have and the moment. What is the moment? The moment is going to be the force multiplied from the point of application of that force towards the center of resistance. So depending on that relationship between the force and the moment is the type of movement that we are going to get Depending on that relationship, we control crown movement, uncontrolled crown movement, controlled root movement, uncontrolled root movement. So what is the importance of the attachments? The attachments are going to help us to generate that movement. Because when we add an attachment, what we are doing is that we are giving that uh, tooth a point of application of the force that will allow me to get the root movement that I had desire. So my recommendation is, Okay, do not remove attachments in cases where you want to do missile translation, distalization movements or angulations. If you have a patient that, okay, maybe they don't want attachment, they, uh, they maybe work in the TV or in cinema or I don't know, they work in the, out in the public. Okay, note that if you don't use attachments, then what is going to happen is that well, you are going to get more tipping than root movement. But you can also go and add an attachment on the lingual or palatal surface. And this is something that you can do. The movement is not going to be the same. Why? Because, okay, let's imagine in here that I have an incisor. But this is useful, even when we have veneers and we cannot bond attachments on the buccal surface. So when we have, for example, in here, the center resistance, our software calculates the moment, and this is something it does automatically to get the root movement uh, when we bond in there an attachment. However, if we bond an attachment in here, for example, you can see that the distance for where we are applying the force is going to be different as if I was going to apply an attachment here in the lingual surface. I'm going to be more direct. So the predictability of the movement is not going to be the same, but it's also going to help you. So this is something that you can take into consideration for cases that maybe you have been years. Okay, go ahead and put a bot, uh, an attachment in the back. Uh, but normally our softwares, and I think all the software in the market, they calculate this with the buccal attachment. So with attachments and in this study of Garino Francesco, what they saw is that they were able to get distalization of two millimeters with intrusion of one millimeter of posterior teeth in five distalized teeth 
in canine premolars and molars, when they use those attachments, they got bodily movement, just like the same as when you are using appendix appliance or when you are using uh, mini implants with braces. You were able to get full bodily movement. And in the situation where they went ahead and they would do this without attachments, what they got was distal crown tipping. So this is something to take into consideration because if you don't add those attachments, then you're not going to be able to get the root movement that you desire. And this applied the same for angulations. So here is just the same. The study is saying that we cannot control very well the roots if we don't want the attachments. But also in here, this is very important. And this study was done in Germany by Julian collaborators. And what they did is they study what was the best way for us to bond the attachments. It is not just simply to go bond the attachments and that's it. We need to make sure that we don't have these flashes in there of this excess of composite. Because what happens? Imagine that you are working with braces and you go and you have an excess of composite in top of the bracket in here. So that bracket, that bracket prescription is now not going to be the same because now the angulation is going to be different. The same thing applies to the aligner. That aligner is meant when we have an attachment in there to touch the tooth and just the attachment. If you have excess in there of composite, let's say this is the attachment and then you have a little bit of excess of composite in here, a little bit of excess of composite in here. So when that patient puts the aligner on, the only surfaces that are going to be touching or that are going to be touching more are the excess of composite because that shouldn't be there. That aligner was done, created for that composite in there. So actually what that is going to do is that you're going to have less predictable movement. So even the bonding of the attachments are going to affect a lot our outcome. So what do we want? We want to have as less of flashes or composite excess as possible. How do we do that? In this study, what they analyze is that the best way on how we can get uh, less flashes is that they use a high viscosity composite. When I mean high viscosity, this has nothing to do with a uh, flowable composite. Flowable composite, I don't like it. It's not resistance to wear, it's very low, and also it can debond very easily. So it's just like a regular composite but with high viscosity and what they did is that they went ahead they put that high viscosity composite on the template they pushed that template on the patient but they didn't like cure the attachments they removed the template then they cleaned the surfaces of the teeth and on the template that excess and then they went ahead they put the template back on and they like cure it this was the way on how they saw that it was the best way to have the less amount of flashes or excess of composite as possible. So this is something that you can incorporate also into your practice. So in here is just a simple case just to explain to you, to you why I want to make sure I have attachments. So, or when do you want to have attachments? So imagine that you wanted to make extrusion of these incisors, right? And this is this case. So I want to make extrusion in there. So if you want to make an extrusion in here, you need to apply a force that is coming down. If you see the anatomy of the incisors, how are you going to push? There's no way on how you're going to be able to push it. That is why for me, when someone tells me, no, I can make these cases without attachments, for me, it doesn't make sense because first I know that if I don't have an attachment, I don't have a second point of application of the force to generate me a moment. And second, I don't have a surface where we can push. So for me to be able to actually get the extrusion that I want, I need to have an attachment in there. If it is a little extrusion, sometimes it works without attachment, but for big extrusions or anterior open bite cases or cases that I want to also extrude the posteriors, then I need to have this surface. This is the surface where I will go and I will push with that aligner and that will help me to get the extrusion that I want. So when do I need attachments? I need attachments when I want to make extrusions. I need attachments when I want to make angulations. I want to be able to have a place where I can grab my tooth and move it in there, that root. I want to have attachments when I want to make rotations of 
rounded teeth. If I'm making even 40 degrees of rotation on, for example, this incisor, for me, I don't care about an attachment. I know I have a lot of surface in here and in here. But if I'm making a rotation on the premolar, where do I apply the force? I cannot apply the force in here. If I apply the force in here, I'm actually going to get a buccal or lingual movement. I need to apply the force in this surface in here. And in most situations, I don't have a place where I can go in and apply it. If I don't have access, it's just that simple. I don't have a place or I don't have enough space to go in there without a liner and push that tooth. That is why I use an attachment because I want to generate that surface. Even there are doctors, I don't do this anymore. I did this when I was starting. Sometimes there's a little bit of difference, but there are doctors that they even like to go and place an attachment on the vocal and one attachment on the lingual. So this will be up to you, but this is something that can also be done. Uh, so I will want those attachments. Once again, because this is very important for extrusions, for rotations of rounded teeth like premolars. For molar is not so critical, for, but for premolars is something that will benefit you a lot. And also for angulations and finally for intrusions. And this is what I was telling you about, that when I want to make an intrusion, I can do even one, two millimeters very well but I don't need an attachment on both incisors. I need an attachment on the adjacent teeth of the intrusion. Why? Because if you think about it, what I'm doing with the plastic, with the plastic, I'm just simply pushing those teeth in. So this plastic is going to pop out posteriorly because I'm applying a force that is going in, then that aligner will just pop out. And this is something that you, it's just simple to understand. You grab a ruler, in one end of the ruler, you apply pressure, you're going to see how the other end is going to pop or, or to elevate. So what do I do? I go and I put an attachment in here. So it's not that it's a specialized attachment for intrusion like some companies they like to tell you, it's not like that. This attachment is only giving you retention and anchorage. So at the time I put the aligner in, these attachments in here are not going to allow that al aligner to move. So by that aligner not moving, that force that I'm going to be applying of those incisor teeth for making intrusion is going to be constant and is going to be really predictable. And that same thing is something that you can apply in cases that maybe you're planning them for, let's say you have a loss in here, you lost the lower molar. So this tooth got extruded so now you want to make an intrusion of that tooth. So actually you don't need an attachment like this one that is for retention on that tooth. You need an attachment of retention of those adjacent teeth. You can only put it on one. I prefer if I have the possibility to put it in those two adjacent teeth. So this means that that liner will just squeeze there very tightly and will apply a lot of force into this tooth and is not going to be able to pop out because we have those retention attachments in there. So, well, this is just like a quick share of how we can use those attachments and why we want to use them. Just the last two points uh, before we finish. I'm just going to move a little bit faster here. Then interproximal context. This is very important. I will show you this case later. You can see how we have those canines that are really rotated. And you can see that now, in a refinement, one canine moved really well and the other didn't track. Why this happened? This happens in most of the situation because these interproximal contacts are really tight. And this has nothing to do with the software we use. Most of the situation, this has to do with our impressions. And I'm going to not get into details in here because we don't have enough time. But okay, the scanners that you use are going to be affected by the light. This means that there are scanners that they are only going to operate well if you are working almost in a dark room. There are other scanners that they work well with different uh, types of uh, luminosity. So this is something that we need to know. We need to know how our scanner is going to perform the best. And also even the best scanners, they may have some inaccuracies of 100 micras, 200 micras, and this is because these scanners, they were firstly not made for a whole large scanning impression. They were made for scanning just areas of the mouth for doing, for example, 
uh, cat cam, onlays, inlays, crowns. So when we go and we scan the whole arch, then we can get a little bit more of distortion and then the result might not be the one that we want. So it is important in here that we understand our scanner, how it's going to operate the best. And if we use traditional impressions for, use, for us to use materials that maybe are a little bit more hydrophilic because we know the PVS is hydrophobic. There are now some PVS that are more hydrophilic and here you can choose the brand that you want. For me, Aquasil it works really well. But in here is always remembering that, okay, scanners, they are going to have a little bit of distortion, a little bit of inaccuracy and PVS impressions also they are going to shrink a little bit. So what do we need to do in this situation? We need to go and check our interproximal context. I'm going to tell you in just a few moments how we do that. But in here also it is important that you go, and this happens a lot. If you're an orthodontist and you have a general practitioner in your clinic, or if you're a general practitioner, that sometimes you have a patient that comes into your clinic and they say, I want the liners and I want them today. And they have one or two caries and, or cavities. Uh, so you go ahead and you do that caries on that same day. You go, you do the caries and then you take the impression, the PVS impression. So it is important that when you do that, you may have a distortion of the place that you did that composite. This happened because we have the oxygen inhibit layer in there. So it is very important that if you're going to do that, or if you're going to take that impression of the teeth that you restored on that same day, that, okay, always remember to use glycerin in the final light curing, and then to scrub that surface with a little bit of alcohol. By doing that, you can make sure that you are not going to have a distortion in your PVS. If you don't do that, the PVS normally is going to bond to that oxygen inhibit, sorry for the pronunciation, for me it's difficult, this one, inhibited layer. And you're, even you might not tell it, you might not see it very well in the PVS impression, but the distortion is there. So that is why you want to like cure on top of glycerin, then you want to go and just rub it with a little bit of alcohol just to make sure that PVS is not uh, bonding to that oxygen, oxygen layer. So this is very important. So what we want to do, and let me just go ahead. And I'm going to show you this with the web version. So very quickly in here, this is the web version and this is the same case. So we have this case that we wanted to make this rotation. And this is the birams, the ones that you see here on the central, those are the birams that will allow me to disoclude the teeth. So we saw that the left canine rotated really well. So what happens? If you go in here, you can see that actually how I'm planning this case is I'm first rotating the premolar and then I'm expanding the lateral. So this canine has a lot of space to do the rotation right now. So this means that I'm going to have a very predictable outcome. What happened in this situation? And this is one of the key advantages that for me we have. That is that we are able to see if we have a tight contact. So in this side, look, we see this that is in red. This means that this contact is really tight in there. So this means that if I don't check this on the patient, maybe I can have tracking issues. How I can solve this? I can solve this by just telling the technician, do the same thing that you did on this side. Go ahead first and move the lateral and the premolar and then just move the canine or just go ahead and do IPR in here. This patient, the problem was that, well, she didn't show up to the appointment. So that is why she developed that tracking issue. But if you go ahead and you check this clinically, then you might not have any issue because you can solve this. And let me go back in here. So what do we want to do? What we want to do is that, and this is something you don't have to do it. You can tell your assistant to do it. So in every patient, and this is something that I do in my practice, I go on and the assistant already knows that every patient that sits in my chair, the first thing she's going to do is she's going to floss all the teeth. And for that, we use on wax dental floss. So with the wax dental floss, we have the advantage that is one contact is too tight then that you're going to see how it gets ripped. 
So that is how you know if the contact is tight or not. So that assistant just goes ahead and writes that in, well, in a piece of paper. And I just come in, I check again, just those contacts. And I use, and this is my preference. I know doctors that they use IPR strips, the yellow ones. I don't like to use them because I don't want to do IPR. I want to just liberate that contact a little bit. So I like to use that composite strips that are meant for class two restorations. So I just go ahead and use this one, pass it five, 10 times, and I use against the wax dental floss. If it goes in without ripping, then I know that that is enough. I don't want to see in there any space. I just want to liberate that contact a little bit. But this is the important thing about checking our interproximal collisions. The most common situations for us to have in there a tracking issue are normally interproximal contacts that are really tight. So just checking this is going to allow you to make sure that you don't have that, that you don't have tracking issues that are related to that. So finally, just to end up, and this is something that doctors with really experience can tell you. There are cases that we develop posterior open bites. So for me, what I have learned, and I, this for me is different from some of my colleagues because this is for me what I think that has happened. And for the research that I have done, why these posterior open bites are happening. They, for me, happen because of three things. First of all, okay, you have the aligner in there, the patient is biting in the aligner. So those posterior teeth sometimes get intruded a little bit. That is something that is not wrong. You just finish the treatment and normally those posterior teeth are going to super erupt. This for me is no issue. Uh, then you have a second cause. And for me, this is really important. And this is how we take the bite registration. The bite registration for the ones that are taking scanning impressions. Well, you know that when you take that bite registration, the patient is lying down. It, they have their heads towards the back. So just do this exercise. Just put your head towards the back, bite hard in there with your teeth, and then move your head towards the front. Try to put your chin towards your uh, chest. You're going to see how the occlusal contacts change from that position towards the front position. And this has happened because, uh, well, mainly gravity. And this is something that has been reported in the literature by not just dentists, physiotherapists. So when we take the bite registration of a patient lying down, normally what happens is that we are scanning that bite with the mandible a little bit towards the back. So when the patient just stands up, that mandible moves a little bit forward. So we go and we plan contacts on those anterior teeth. We see them in the occlusogram that I show you. We see those contacts and we say, oh no, okay, those contacts are nice. But remember that mandible was in a posterior position when we took that by registration. So in reality, what you're creating in there are really heavy anterior contacts. So when the patient bites, now they are only going to be touching those anterior teeth and that generates a posterior open bite. So we may need to go and do a refinement just to liberate those teeth out of contact. And this is something that you can actually remember, go back to dental school and, or even for the ones that are GPs, that sometimes you go ahead and you make a composite, a class one or a class two, or, yeah, or even just a simple class one. And okay, you adjust the final uh, restoration, patient is biting, they feel everything is perfect. But as soon as they stand up, they tell you, no, no, doctor, now I have an interference. I feel this is high. Why now they feel it different? It's because of this. When the patients stand up, the position of the mandible is going to be different. So this is something for us to take into consideration. So how we avoid this? Okay, we avoid this mainly by just making sure that we don't create uh, red contacts on those anterior teeth. That when we check the final position in the occlusogram, we have a space of around 0.5 millimeters. If we have around 0.5 millimeters of space or, or over, your, over jet, we can make sure that this is not going to happen. And finally, and this is something that I'm not going to go a lot into detail because it's a little bit more complex and for us to talk about this, this can take even a whole week, but these are the patients that they have temporomandibular joint disorders. Though, so there are a lot of patients that they present in our clinic with pain. And those patients normally 
in there, what they have is, well, not all of them. It is important to always make the differential diagnostics, but a lot of those patients, they have the disc displays a little bit forward, right? So when that disc is a little bit displaced forward, uh, what it happens is that we are making pressure to the retrodiscal tissues. And in here is where we have the nerves and that is why it causes pain. This normally happens because the posterior region of the condyle, we know that is the thickest part, sorry, of the disc is the thickest part of the disc. Then and we have this area and here in the middle that is going to be a little bit thinner and the anterior region is a little bit thicker, but the posterior part is always thicker than the anterior. So this thicker part in here sometimes because of how we bite is getting deteriorated and sometimes it just thinnest a little bit and now this allows the condyle to move backwards. So, okay. This happens sometimes in two situations. This happens in class two, division two patients when we have those incisors that are retroclined. So the mandible cannot grow in there. So the condyle is pressing those retrodiscal tissues. So what happens when we normally just procline these incisors a little bit, the mandible will jump forward very, very easily. And that is why you sometimes see those patients of class two, division two, that are half class two or even a full class two. And you see those patients four or five months later and they are almost full class one. This is because that mandible is actually trying to go forward, but it cannot go forward because it is trapped. So this is actually a benefit for us, but for patients that they have a really tight overjet, those patients that are pseudo class three, those patients normally are going to be biting like this. So the original position of the tooth is the one that is with dots in here. And this is the original position of the condyle also here in the back. So those patients, they cannot touch too much those posterior teeth. So what happens? The condyle starts uh, just pressing a lot of the disc until we have a displacement. So the condyle goes backwards. In here, the patient is able to close more to get more contacts on the posterior region. And when this happens, then we have those temporomandibular joint disorders. Well, just this is one of the many that we can have. So in these patients, sometimes we go and we put an aligner. And well, first of all, for you to know, there are several therapies. How I like to solve this is the first I like to use an appliance that is going to reposition the mandible anteriorly. I use that every night uh, for around normally eight, 12 weeks, sometimes even longer. So what I do with that, I bring the condo down and this is going to give me two things. First, we are going to get a remodelation of the retrodiscal tissue. This starts to get fibrosis. So when the mandible goes back into position, we get, uh, we don't have any pain because this became avascular and this has been reported by Ockeson and by a lot of these experts in joints. Um, but also sometimes we can stabilize the condyle in there. So this is normally how we do it. We just use an occlusal appliance that is just displacing the mandible anteriorly. So what happens when we are using aligners, you need to remember that we are disoccluding the teeth. We don't have any occlusal contact. This is the difference with braces. So by us not having occlusal contacts, this means that the mandible can move very freely. So there are situations when we have patients that have underjet and they have temporomandibular joint disorders and we didn't diagnose them, that as soon as we put that aligner on, and this is not a treatment that we do in two months. Normally, a liner treatment is, takes one, two years. So this just opens the vertical dimension. The patient gets an improvement of the TMJ issues, but the mandible displaces forward a little bit because, well, it's really, it can move towards any place it wants because there's no causal contacts in there. So it can just go to the more relaxed position. So what happens is that in a large situation where we have a very tight overjet or even an anterior crossbite, this can get worse. We can even generate an anterior crossbite because of that. So in these situations, it's very important, the initial part, to first diagnose if we have a temporomandibular disorder, if we don't know how to treat them, to refer them. So someone with more experience can first treat them. Also because in this situation, what sometimes happens is that that pterygoid muscle 
contracts. So that is why you develop a posterior open bite. But when the pterygoid uh, muscle starts, when you finish the treatment, it starts stretching once again, well, the mandible goes back into the position and you get posterior contacts. So in here, the most important thing is to know why you're getting that posterior open bite. And normally are those anterior contacts that, as you saw, can happen in different ways. I know it was a lot of information. I see that we have some questions, but first I'm going to transfer the call to Constantine. And I just want to thank you a lot for well being here today. So I will just transfer this to Constantine. David, thank you very much. It was really, really amazing. Um, I can see that we have some questions. Let me answer the very first one. Uh, it is uh, basically uh, regarding the YouTube translation, if it's going to be um, recorded or not. Of course, it's going to be recorded. And of course, we will send the link today or tomorrow to every uh, registrant on this webinar. So no worries here. Um, David, we can have the, we see the, I see the question mm -hmm. regarding the IPR. Can you please answer that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Who is calculating the IPR? So this depends. And what I mean, it depends. It means to our instructions. This is why I was talking so much about the treatment planning because sometimes doctors, they go and they say, okay, I don't want, I just want to align from canine to canine. I don't want to move the posterior teeth. So if we don't move the posterior teeth, then we are not able to expand. If we are not able to expand, we are losing the opportunity to get a space. So that means that if we are limited, that means that the only way for us to go ahead and to make, uh, for example, to align those teeth is with IPR. So this depends a lot of our instructions. So if you tell the technician, okay, I don't want to do IPR, then they are not going to do it. But you need to know that you are going to get expansion, you're going to get proclination. So you need to also see the periodontal type of the patient. If the patient has a very thin periodontal type or if the patient already has recessions, then it's in these situations where I will actually want to use IPR. But uh, calculating the IPR normally is the technician, uh, well, the technician, and then it is important that all of these cases are supervised by us, by doctors that are actually working with these appliance. It is not like in other places. And I told you this because in Costa Rica, we have all the aligners companies available on the market. All of them are here. Align Technologies, Small Direct, all of them, they are here. <laughs> they are in Costa Rica. So in a lot of situations, most of the doctors that work in these companies, they are only working in there. They stop their practice. They just want to be relaxed. So in Exit, one of our requests or one of our actually how to say it like yeah like a is something necessary all of our supervisors need to be working privately they have their own uh, clinics and they are using these appliances so all of us we go and we supervise this case and we say okay no in this case you may not need to have this ipr so we are going to remove it and do a little bit of proclination but this is so just to get back to the question, the recalculating of the IPR will depend on your instruction. If you're allowed to do expansion or proclination, it will depend on the periodontal type of the patient. If you uh, place photographs, normally the supervisor, the orthodontist, is going to see if how the periodontal type is and it will tell the technician, okay, do IPR or not? Because if we already see recessions, we are not going to tell them to expand. We don't want to cause a periodontal issue just because we want to have better teeth. And also, well, the necessity, how much space we have and how much space we need. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question, uh, David, I hope you can see it as well from uh, Dr. Tim. Um, how much crown torque slash proclination is possible? What is a good incisal angle? Uh, well, is that this depends on how you measure it. Remember that you can, okay, you have the intercisal angle that takes into consideration the upper and lower. So that is around 130 degrees. If you use um, Cilla, well, Cilla, uh, sorry, I don't know how to say it in English, uh, Cilla Turca to Nation and then to incisors or to upper incisor or to lower incisor, then it's a different angle. If you use Nation to the anterior point, uh, then it is going to be a different angle. So my recommendation will be, okay, uh, to in this situation, for the ideal, okay, to 
analyze, okay, what I just mentioned, periodontal type. For me, always I base my the amount of torque that I do and the expansion with the periodontal type because this is what will tell me if I can do a lot or I cannot do a lot. So, and also the values, well, that you like the most. If you like to use the torque attenuation, then use that one. Or if you want to use NA or NB, then to use that one. So regarding the amount of movement, I will tell you that for incisors, what I think is predictable, it is around 10 to 15 degrees. However, if I want to get the whole expression of the movement, I will not ask for 10 or 15 degrees. So let's say you need 12 degrees to get to an ideal position. So I will tell the technician, okay, overcorrect, do 17 degrees of movement or do 20 degrees of movement. I'm actually requesting for more. So what can I do? And this is something that you can also plan in your cases. Okay, let's say that what you want to overcorrect is the rotation or what you want to correct is the intrusion. So I will tell the technician, okay, go ahead, give me that ideal position, that final perfect position that I want. And after that position, begin doing more torque or begin doing more intrusion or begin doing more rotation. So that means that when you finish uh, your case, well, when you get to that final position that for, I, uh, in the software is perfect, you can evaluate this on the patient and you say, no, I need more torque. So I will just give those extra aligners to the patient or no, actually this case tracked very well. I got all the um, torque that I wanted. So I just finish in here. So for me, that is one of the best things that you can do. Always add extra movement at the end of the treatment and at the end of the treatment, well, not at the end, but when you get to that final position virtually, uh, that is the ideal. You evaluate if you need to continue the treatment or not. Okay. Thank you, David. We have uh, another question from uh, another attendee. Uh, what kind of materials do you recommend for the production? So, um, first of all, Exceed is an open system, so you can um, use any kind of materials you want, uh, as long as they are certified. Uh, we personally recommend the Dreve by Biolon. Uh, I'm sorry, the Biolon by Dreve, and the uh, Durand Plus uh, by Scheudenthal. Both are German materials, both are certified, works great. But, uh, like I said before, you can use the um, any kind of material you want, maybe uh, some more expensive materials like uh, Zendura or uh, something else. But uh, the list of the recommended equipment and the materials you can uh, you can also find it on our website and our tech page. So <clears throat> yeah, all information regarding the uh, in-office production is there. Uh, Dr. Loston is asking, uh, are we using the PTG or PU for the materials? Like I said, you can uh, take a look at the uh, exit minus ortho slash tech, and there uh, pretty much everything is answered regarding the production part. Um, the fees per case, uh, we charge uh, per case, like, um, like we said before. Um, if it's uh, less than 20 aligners, it's 190 euros. If it's more than it's 240. Um, but again, I will send you all this information in per, per email, so uh, no worries there. Um, is there any other questions? Well, I wanted to tell you about that, uh, about the material that we use. Okay, yeah, the one that I recommend yeah, is the one that you have told, Ericador or Bylon. It is very important. Well, it is very important for me that the material that we use are based in science. And if actually you go ahead and you search on, well, in, in MedPub or any searcher that you want, you can see that Biolon and Ecuador, they have a lot and a lot of, well, independent studies by universities. So that is what I want to use. I don't want to go and use a study from independent or from people that are paid. I want to go and use a study from university. And what they see is that Biolon and Ercador and other materials, they apply a force and actually even more force than what we need. That is why the same thing. We don't want to activate those aligners too much. We don't want to increase too much the velocities because those aligners really are capable of producing really high forces. So this is important. And that is why also we recommend because there are a lot of studies telling us about, well, 
their efficiency and not only by the, their efficiency but also remember that you have th different thickness so how by you changing the thickness is going to apply a lot more force or a little bit less force okay well i think um all answers uh, all questions are answered so um let me thank you from my heart for uh, participating in this webinar david thank you very much for the uh, fantastic presentation and we will see you at the next webinar. Thank you very much. You have a good day. Stay healthy. And thank you all for coming today. And yeah, we are always at your disposal. So yeah. Yes, in... our contacts are on the yeah. screen. So uh, like I said before, uh, the mm -hmm. record replay will be uh, sent later. If you have any questions, let us know. David, bye-bye. Bye-bye to everyone.